So, um, you are all welcome to my YouTube channel. So today we are going to look at the concept of uh, uh, chemistry of amino acid and proteins. And I hope if this is the first time you are coming to my YouTube channel, please subscribe. So, uh, actually proteins in the brain, proteins in the body have a variety of functions. The proteins in the body have a variety of functions. It has so many functions. And of course, some of the functions of those proteins include um, structural support, repair of the damaged tissues, catalyzing chemical reactions. There are so many functions of the proteins. And of course, the functions of the proteins depend on actually the building blocks. That is the nature of the building blocks. So, but what are the building blocks? So, when we say proteins are actually a biopolymer, is a biopolymer of amino acids. The biopolymer of an amino acid. It means that proteins is the polymer of an amino acid. It means that thousands of an amino acids or hundreds of an amino acids joined together to produce the protein. And of course, how these proteins or how these amino acids form the protein is actually true what you can type out. So as we said. The protein is a biopolymer of an amino acid. So what you usually happen is that if you have amino acid like this, so these are your amino acids. These are the amino acids. So these amino acids, what they do actually they join together. Join together to know what you call a peptide bond, peptides bond. Or sometimes you can see, or you can see, or sometimes these peptide bonds, this peptide bond that we are called amides, are called amides bond. Amide bond. So you can call it either, either, you can call it a peptide bond or an amide bond. So, these amino acids are the building blocks of protein. So, what they usually do, they join together through what you call uh, a peptide bond to generate the protein. So, therefore, a protein is a biopolymer of an amino acid. So, this is your proteins. So, of course, one amino acid joined with another amino acid. One amino acid joined with an amino acid through a peptide bond. So therefore, this peptide bond linked one amino acid to another to generate the proteins. You know what I mean? The proteins. So, amino acid is the building block. Amino acid is the building block of protein. So therefore, if you want to build the proteins that you need to uh, have an amino acid. So it's like you want to build a room, so you need a blocks of building the room. So in this case, your room is your protein. So you need a blocks that you can use to build that of your room, which is the proteins. So what are the blocks that do that is an amino acid? So how do you link one of the blocks to another for you to have your construct structure of your room? You need a bond that will link them. And the bond that links to this amino acid is called a peptide bond. Or if you check some other test groups, it is called an amide bond. So proteins in the body, the proteins on the body have a variety of function. The proteins in the body have a variety of functions. 
So proteins in the body have a variety of functions, and these varieties of functions include. So these varieties of functions of the protein include to number one, proteins can have what you call the structural support. They have structural supports. And then another function of the proteins metabolic processes. Metabolic process. Like for example, when we say metabolism, it means it's a sum total of all biochemical actions or the sum total of all biochemical actions that are taking place in the body. So the sum total of all biochemical actions that are taking place in the body is what we call metabolism. So are the proteins playing a role in metabolism? Yes. Because there is no metabolism if there is no enzymes. So enzymes is a key to metabolism because the metabolism is the reactions. So it's a, a the sum total of all reactions. So in each reaction, before one substrate is converted to reactant, you need an enzyme. So most of the proteins or most of the enzymes that we have in the body that are involved in the metabolic reactions, they are proteins. So generally, most of the enzymes, enzymes that are involved in catalyzing the uh, metabolic reactions in the body, they are, they are proteins. And then apart from the metabolic activities, Enzymes also involve in uh, sorry proteins are involved in transport, transportation, transportation. Like for example, in the red blood cell, in the red blood cell RPC, in the red blood cell we have what we hemoglobin, and of course we know that the main functions of the uh, of the red blood cells in the body is the transport of oxygen. So now the answer is the question is what to make the red blood cells to be transporting oxygen in the body is because of the proteins that is present in the red blood cell. And that protein is hemoglobin. We have hemoglobin. So we have hemoglobin in the red blood cells that is responsible for the transport of oxygen from one part of the body to another part of the body. In fact, apart from hemoglobin, we have albumin. Albumin is also a protein that also involves in the transport of fatty acids. So uh, it has a variety of functions. Then apart from the transportation, enzymes have also its help the body or its protect the body, protection of the body. Protection of the body. protection of the body. But now the question is how the proteins or how the enzymes protect our body or how the proteins protect our body is we know that actually we have what you call uh, white blood cell. White blood cell. White DC. White blood cell. So we know that the major functions of white blood cells in the body is protect us, is to protect us against any foreign microorganisms. And of course, in the, immune, in the immunology, we have first line of action and we have second line of action. And we know that in the immunology, you have antigen antibodies reaction. So the antigen antibodies reaction, the antigen is protein and also the antibodies are proteins. They are called immunoglobulins. So generally, the antigens and the antibodies, the antibodies that fight the that, that fight antigen, or the antibodies that fight antigens from microorganisms or from any foreign substances that can cause danger in our body, is called antibodies. So the antibodies are usually found in humans. It's, it's, it's the soldiers that we have in our body. So they are called immunoglobulins and they are proteins and we find them in the red blood cell. And in fact, it's because they are present in the red blood cells, that is why they protect us. The, the red blood cells is protecting us from 
the danger from microorganisms. So the white blood cells is because it has a protein called hemoglobin, and that is why it protects us from uh, from attacked by microorganisms. Then in addition, apart from the protections of the body, they can also serve or they can also involve cellular recognition. They do that. So this is number five, cellular recognition. Cellular recognition and communication. So cellular recognition and communication, so generally in, in most of our cells, in the surface of our cell membrane, we have what you call receptors. We have receptors. And most of those receptors that are present on the surface of our red blood cells, they are either a protein or glycoproteins. And of course, in that case, the uh and that's uh so in that case, the, the receptor on the surface of the cell membrane, they are proteins or glycoproteins. So therefore, what happens? So if there is anything that comes into the cell, there is a ligand. There is a ligand, maybe from the microorganisms or from the body system, that will bind to the receptor. And as a result of that binding, the reactions will be triggered. And of course, the cell will be communicated if the ligand is coming actually from the body microorganisms, then the body will feel far the work because that fight that for the organization. So a cellular communication, cellular recognition that are involved in the body system and is usually due to the presence of the proteins that are found in the surface of our cell membrane. So we should understand that proteins play a lot of vital roles in our body. In fact, I just listed five, but there are so many functions. There are so many functions of the proteins. So therefore, as the time goes on in this lecture, we are going to explore a lot of the functions of the proteins. But because at this point, we are actually trying to look at the most important thing with the component of the amino acids. So as we said, actually, um, we said that in our plan, as I said, we are going to look at the chemistry of amino acids and proteins, and we said that proteins is the biopolymer of an amino acid. It means that we want to get proteins, then we need amino acids. So that amino acid is a building block of the proteins. So you need them. They must be there. They, they must be there. Those proteins must be present before you get so in those amino acids they are very very important before you get a protein so they are the blocks so if there is no amino acid then there is no protein so how these blocks or the amino acid join together is to make a five type one from a four demand of the proteins and of course the proteins have the varieties of function it has the varieties of function and these varieties of function include structural support metabolic process, transportation, production of the body, cellular recognition and manipulation. There is also, apart from that, there are a lot of functions of proteins and if the time goes on, we are going to explore them. Okay? So, uh, one more thing is that the structure and the functions of the protein. Proteins have different level of structure and function. So the structure and the functions of the proteins depend on so many factors. They depend on so many factors. One of the factors, the structure and the functions of the proteins depend on so many things. And that thing is actually is based on the amino acid. Because number one, they depend on the nature of the nature of the amino acids so number one 
the nature of the amino acid present also uh, determine the structure and the content of the proteins. That is the first thing. And then second, the sequence, the sequence in which the amino acid the sequence One, the nature of the amino acids that are present in the protein and then the sequence in which the amino acids are present. So the sequence and the nature of the amino acids play a role on the structure and the functions of the protein. And then the next one is actually the partial relationship. The partial relationship relationship the spatial relationship between the, the, the spatial relationship of amino acids, the spatial relationship of amino acids of those that are present, or the spatial relationship of amino acids with one another. With one another. So these are actually the three, the 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 the, 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 the three things that the structure and the functions of the proteins depend on. You see that some proteins they have some specific shape, while some proteins have some specific functions. And one thing that we should understand that generally we have. 20 amino acids that are found in proteins in every living organism. Let me start by saying that there are over there are over 300 amino acids. Amino acid on earth. There are over 300 amino acids on earth. But not all the amino acids that are found in proteins. Only 20 amino, only 20 amino acids are found in protein. There are only 20 amino acids that are found in proteins. There are only 20 amino acids that are found in proteins, but we have over 300 amino acids. Some of them are dried, some of them are synthesized artificially in the laboratory, but we have 20 amino acids that are found in proteins. So, but their arrangement and how the sequence of the pro of the amino acid are in the proteins differ from one another, and that is why we have different proteins. We have insulin, glucagon, they are all proteins. We have adrenaline, they are all proteins. We have uh, hemoglobin, it is a protein. Albumin is a protein. Crystalline in the eyes, there are proteins. Reduction in the eyes, there are proteins. Some neurotransmitters in the brain, there are proteins. But they are different from one another. Why is it that they are different from one another? It's because of the nature of the that are present in each of those proteins. And then second, the sequence, because their sequence are not the same. Because if the sequence of the proteins and the nature of, sorry, if the sequence of the amino acid and the nature of the amino acid in all the proteins are the same, they will not, there will be no difference from each other. So you see, because in some proteins, you will see that you have maybe 51 amino acids in the case of insulin. Or maybe in the case of hemoglobin, I think there are about 146, yeah, I think around 146 amino acids somehow. But just the most important thing is to understand that even in terms of the number of amino acids, it's different from one protein. So that is why the structure and the functions of the proteins depend on the number of the acids that are found there. That is the nature and the sequences. How many? of the amino acid are there and how are they arranged? That is in terms of the 
stretch here relationship for one amino acid with another in the proteins. So that is why we should understand that the functions of the proteins depend structure and the functions of the proteins depend on the amino acids. The nature of the amino acid and the functions of the and the radio sequence as well as the spatial relationship between the amino acid in the sequence. So these three things are very important when we are trying to know the functions and the structure of the amino acid, sorry, of the proteins. Like for example now, as a scientist or as a medical practitioner or as a student from life sciences, you can just, okay, this is a hemoglobin and this is, uh, let's say, uh, insulin and they are all protein. So ask yourself, why is it this is an insulin? Why this is never lagging? Why this is very toxic? It's because of the amino acid. It differ from one another. But all these 20 amino acids that we are seeing, in most cases, you can find all the 20 amino acids. But the nature of the arrangement of the amino acids in the proteins is different. That is why one protein differs from one another. Also, that is why the structure of one protein differs from one another. So we should understand that when we are talking about proteins, so the proteins depend on many factors in terms of the arrangement of the amino acid the sequence of the acid and the special relationship between the amino acid and the proteins. And that's why we make one protein differ from one another. So we should get that. And of course, even in terms of the number of the amino acids in each and every protein, they are different. So now, the next thing now we are going to look at the amino acids. So let's look at the amino acids closely. So um, amino acids, So this is what we are going to look at for the amino acids. So the most important thing that we should understand in this amino acid is to understand the structure and the nature of the amino acids. So generally, um, amino acids is like this. It has carbon, it has the central carbon. The central carbon is attached to COOH, that is it attaches to carboxylic group, and then it also attached to amino. It's also attached to amino group. Has amino group, and then it also have the free hydrogen. A free hydrogen, and then finally, it also have an R. So, this is how the nature of an amino acid is it has amino group, free hydrogen, carboxylic group, and R side chain. So, each and every amino acid have this. It has amino group, it has free hydrogen and carboxylic group. So any amino acid has this. But the only thing that makes one amino acid differ from one another is the R side chain. Is the R side chain. So all amino acids have carboxylic group and amino group. And of course, we know that from the basic knowledge of chemistry, carboxylic group is a functional group. Amino group is the functional group. So therefore, in amino acid, we have two We have two functional groups. And this two functional group is carboxylic group and amino group. And in addition, what do you call this carbon? The carbon would that attach or the central carbon that attach to this or the friend units. So it's not that we have ways of naming 
uh, carbon. Like for example, if we have this, we have C O O H like this, and we have this, we have carbon here as H two. We also have another carbon here C H two. Yes, C H two. Maybe we have another one C H two. So if you want to normalize this carbon. We usually start from the carbon functional we will call it carbon one. So the carbon next to the carbon group is called alpha carbon. And then we don't buy beta carbon. And then the gamma carbon. So the name follows like this. So therefore now this is a carbon functional group. And of course we have a carbon here. So what do you call the carbon here? It's called alpha. It's alpha carbon. And since here there is not any other carbon, then you stop here. So this carbon is called alpha carbon. And more importantly, more importantly, one thing that you should know is that there is what you call stereoisomerism. So amino acid on the whole. Stereo isomerism. Stereo isomerism. And why is it that it can go in stereo isomerism? You see, we know that any carbon that has four different groups attached to it, so that uh, compound is said to undergo stereo isomerism. So that is why this carbon is a kind of active carbon. So that is why generally amino acid, because in each and every amino acid, we must have at least one of this carbon, except in the case of glycine. So therefore, the most important thing that we should know, the most important thing that we should know here is that in this case, we have four different groups attached to this carbon. So any carbon that has four different groups attached to it, it is called stereogenic carbon. It is called stereogenic carbon. Or stereogenic carbon. Or oh, in some test books, they will tell you that it is for chiral carbon. Or oh, it can sometimes be done even called stereogenic center. So it is called stereogenic carbon or stereogenic center. So this is an alpha carbon with four different groups attached to it. So any carbon with four different groups attached to it, it is called stereogenic. Carbon, or, or we call it chiral carbon. So in this case, we have stereogenic carbon and we have chiral carbon. So what are we going to do now? Okay, so we can even calculate what we call the stereoisomer. So that is why this one we said they are set on the most stereoisomerism. They are set to on the most stereoisomerism. So why, I, why is it that the undergoes to where is It's because of this stereogenic carbon. And we have a formula for calculating stereogenic carbon. The formula, so in the number of stereoisomers, you can calculate the number of stereoisomers. Stereoisomers. So the formula is 2 power n. The formula is 2 power n. So we have to calculate the number of Stereo isomers. So, what this end represents? Represent, it represents the number of the number of chiral carbon. The number of chiral carbon. So, how many chiral carbon do we have here? It's only one. So that is why right here we have two power one. So two power one is equal to. So it means that amino acid has two stereo isomers. It has two stereoisomers. That is why none of these stereoisomers can be love retortory, love retortory, 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 or dextro, dextro, retortory, retortory. So this lab rotary is called N isomer. It's called N isomer. And of course, this 
Dexter Petrie is called the isoma. So now, the most important thing that we should know that um, our amino acids can be in the form of laboratory or dextrotretotrate. So now, look at it, we have then first of all we have DIC. So this is how we represent amino acid in D and LIC. So you see, so what is the difference between the D and L? If you look at the D here, you see that the amino group is at the right side. So that is why it is called the isoma. And if you look at this one, the amino group is at the left. So that is why it's called L isoma. So laboratory amino acid and then dextrotretri amino acid. So you should understand that we have L and D isoma of amino acid, and more importantly, the amino acid that are found in the humans. The amino acid that are found in that are found in humans is the so we doesn't have D isoma amino acid in our body. We cannot synthesize them, and even if we even take them in our food, our body cannot process them. So our body only have an enzymes that can process the isoma, but our body doesn't actually uh, process and metabolize the D isoma. Although we have some intestinal microorganisms that are present in our small intestine and of course they are the ones that sometimes help us to mobilize that but our body doesn't actually recognize the amino acid and our body cannot uh, process it. Okay? So as uh, we said we have all amino acids have amino group, carboxylic group and this pyramid but it's only the other group that is different from one another. So now, for example, with our, if this are, uh, let's say if you have for uh, R is equal to H. So you know that we have H here. So the amino acid that have hydrogen as the outside chain is called glycine. It's called glycine. And of course, by looking at the glycine here, does it actually, the carbon here, does it have polygon groups attached to it? No, because there are hydrogen and hydrogen here, so there are like two different groups that are attached to it. So that is why glycine are not on the go. Glycine do not go stereo isolated. Stereo isomerism. Because it doesn't have chiral carbon to this hydrogen because here we already have hydrogen and another hydrogen is attached so that is why it doesn't undergo stereoisomerism. So we can also have an amino acid that has the outside change to be CH3. So we now place a R to CH3. So the amino acid that has CH3 is alanine. We have alanine. So this is alanine. So it has CH3. And of course, alanine from here, you know that it can undergo optical isomerism or stereo isomerism because, of course, the metal group is different from all the other groups here. So that is why it's only glycine and all the stunty amino acid is only glycine that doesn't undergo uh, stereo isomerism. And then, apart from this, there are so many other amino acids. We have 20 amino acids. And each of that amino acid, each of that amino acid have their own different side So the most important thing after watching this video is that we are going to look at this amino acid and how one of the amino acids differ from one another. It's very, very important to understand how one amino acid differ from one another. And it's based on this side chain. Like for example, as we said here, we have CH3. So, like for example, in the situation where we have, for example, we have uh we have a valine. So in the case of valine, what happened to valine? A valine actually has something like this. It has the uh, CH here, then of course another CH3 here, then we have CH3. So it means that if you look at the side chain here, you will understand that in the case of Valine. So this is our valine. 
This is value. This is value. So in the case of value, it has CH, 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 it has CH, and of course, there is two different CH tree attached to it. So after valine, we also have an amino acid called uh, leucine. So in the case of leucine, it's almost similar with valine, but the only difference in the case of leucine that it's CH2 here. There is CH2 here. See? The carbon, then you have CH2, then you have CH, then you have by this. So this one is leucine. This is leucine. Okay. Then, so this is leucine, then after leucine, then there are also so many other amino acids, and it's actually depend on, based on the different side chain. So there is also um, an isoleucine. So in the case of isoleucine, in the case of isoleucine, what actually happened in the case of isoleucine, we also have a uh, similar thing. Uh, the only difference is that because it has, we have CH3, so now apart from the, 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 apart from the CH here, then there is also a CH2 here. There is also a CH2, then of course another synthesis 3 years. Really for the ISO, you see, this is the ISO, you see. So you can see that actually there is an improvement in drawing the structure of an amino acid. So you are just actually going to flee with the uh, tips, then you will be able to draw the exact structure of each and um, every amino acid. The only difference is actually trying to know what's the outside change of each and every amino acid is. So therefore, and of course, if you want to know each and uh, the structure of each and every amino acid, then I'm also going to upload uh, a short video that will show us how one of each and every amino acid differ with one another in terms of the, uh, the size change. So now we are going to look at the nomenclature of amino acids. So, um, the next thing is nomenclature, nomenclature of amino acids. We have three weeks of uh, writing, uh, we have three weeks of representing amino acids. We can use one single data and we can use uh, two labels. So let's look at the amino acid and learn the, the first letters and then the uh, single, sorry, the single letters annotation and then the three letters notation. So let's look at that. So, um, in this case, we are going to look at the uh, association and the nomenclature of an amino acid. So, as I said, we have a three letters of representing amino acid, and we also have a single letters of representing amino acids. So, like for example, now we have amino acid that, if you look at their structure, as I said, I'm going to, in fact, in the cover of this video, I'm going to not the amino acids. So, in this case, we have amino acid that in their R side chain, they have positive charge. They have positive charge. And this amino acid will have IgA. And the three data that you can use to represent, because you can't just be able, oh, you can't be writing the full name of an amino acid when trying to draw or when trying to actually uh, write the sequence of a protein. So it's usually either you use a single letter notation or you use a three letter notation. So that's the importance of this one that you should understand each and every amino acid has a three letters notation and then a single letter notation. So in the case of arginine, 
it has a three-letter notation and single-letter notation. So three-letter notation is A R G, and the single-letter notation is R. So whenever you are doing, uh, whenever you are dealing with fourteen and C R, so that is R G and O A R G, and of course his student is his H I S, his capital letter H has a single-letter notation. Then you have nice. LYS with Q as a single letter notation. And then we have a static acid. As, so, so in this are positive, that is the amino acid that in their R side chain, they have a positive charge. And we also have amino acid that in their R side chain, they have negative charge. So those amino acids we have as static acids D. And this three letter notation is ASP. Glutamic acids. So these are the amino acids and the single letter notation with a three letter notation. And these are the amino acids with which are they are folder, but they are on charge. They don't have charge in them, but they are folder. Remember when you said polar, it means that they can interact with water. That is the hydrophilic. So we have them. So here we have the amino acids that are folder. But on charge, we have serine, threonine, and aspartate. And then we have amino acids which are hydro with hydrophobic side chain. That is the dosing interact with water. They are side chain dosing interact with water. So we have valine, alanine, isoleucine, leucine, methionine, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan. But we also have other ways of classifying amino acids. You can have acidic, you can have acidic amino acids. You can have basic amino acids. Like for example, phenylalanine, tyrosine, and phenylalanine. We classify them based on how, based on their structure, or based on how their structure look like. What we call they are called aromatic amino acids. They are called aromatic amino acids. And why are they called aromatic amino acids? Because in their ring or in their structure or in their outside chains, they have aromatic ring. And then the phenylalanine, tyrosine, and tryptophan, they are called aromatic amino acids. Then after this, apart from these aromatic amino acids, amino acids are also classified whether they are acidic or basic. So for example, in this case, even from here we can see aspartic acids, glutamic acids, it means that they are acidic amino acids. We also have basic amino acids, like for example, the glutamine and asparagine, they are basic amino acids because they have additional they have additional amino group in their side chain so that is why they are called basic amino acid and of course for this acidic amino acid is because they have another COOH group that is another carboxylic group and that is why they are called basic amino sorry acidic amino acids and of course we have amino acid special cases system Cellular system, uh, glycine and proline are uh, amino acids that are classified based on their special case. Like for example, in the case of glycine, it doesn't have stereogenic carbon. So that is why they have special cases and that is why they are classified on their list. So they are classified as the special cases. So um, that is this. So um, we are now going to look at the dipolar nature of an amino acid. So ladies and gentlemen, for me to continue this lecture, please um, let's meet in the next video and then to look at how the dipolar nature of an amino acid will look like. Thank you.